All right, so we're going to talk about test taking. As uh, I was in the residency office for 14 years, program director for a decade. Uh, LA County USC was a big training program. Uh, at that time, we were 18 residents per year, so you'd have 72 residents at any given time. And so among that group, you would have people struggling with exams. And I spent a lot of time as a program director working directly with people on that and uh, also have been writing questions for a long time, worked on uh, Pier 6 back when, and have done a lot of item writing over the years, both for the residency and beyond. And you learn a lot when you item write. And one of the things through both of these processes, working with the residents who are having problems, quote unquote, I'm a bad test taker, um, I learned that being a bad test taker really exists. Now, there, it exists sort of in two forms. One form is I don't know anything. Okay, that's, that will make you a bad test taker. Um, the other form is I should have got the question right, but I still got it wrong because I'm a bad test taker. And um, there's also uh, such a thing as a really good test taker. And good test takers get questions right even though they have no idea what the answer is. And so between sort of looking at those processes, I began to sort of get very interested in test taking and learn a lot about how they were, uh, how, how it works for people and what are some of the fixed errors. And I got a couple messages for you, because you're in the early group, that because your life is not taking tests every day, you're clinically active people taking care of patients, which is not a test taking scenario by any means. It's certainly not multiple choice, if only it were that easy. Um, you need to get back into that test taking mode. And the only way to do that, and part of the reason we do the review sessions at night, is to get you looking at questions. But if, and I have no financial stake in these things, but I would look at, there's a couple of products out there. There's the 1200 board review questions. There's another Peter Sokolov book, a thousand questions. There's peer seven and now is eight out? And peer eight is out. Um, the peer questions. Um, I would tell you um, that doing questions and practicing and talking about some of the strategies we're going to talk about in the next 25 minutes can make you a significantly better test taker if you're not a good test taker already without knowing anything more. It can make, in my experience with residents on an in-service exam of 225 questions, just working on their test taking skills is easily worth 10 to 15 percentage points on their score. You can raise their score 10 percentage points just by going over test taking. And so I think it's a pretty important thing. If you can increase your score 10 points without knowing anything different, that matters. And many of you, even if you're pretty good test takers because you haven't been in that test taking mode, you're rusty now. So doing practice questions is important. Now Challenger, again, no financial interest, uh, outside. Challenger also has a version for on your computer. A lot of people at this time come to me and say, you know, I've never taken a test like this where my career was on the line on a computer in blocks of 20 questions and things like that, and I'm a little anxious about it. And so Challenger has a computerized version where you can do it on your computer and get used to that. And if you're worried about that, you should go to where you're going to take the test. They have, often have sessions where you can sit down and practice there and see what it's like so that you're familiar with it so that you don't have all the unfamiliarity of a new testing place, a new testing ma um, um, vehicle at the time you're, you know, hanging out your shingle um, for critical analysis. So let's talk about it. When you're looking at questions, questions all come with two parts, well, three parts. They come with the stem, that's the question. They come with four wrong answers, those are the foils and they come with a correct answer. So every question has three parts, a stem, a correct answer, and four foils. Now, one of the things you learn when you write questions is you'd think that the question writers would be all excited about the question. They're not. You can come up with questions easily when you're item writing. You can come up with all kinds of questions. You learn very quickly when you've written exams for residents over a decade you learn very, very quickly that the hard thing is to come up with foils. Reasonable wrong choices that are definitely wrong is much harder than coming up with a good question and a right answer. And that's going to be very important. And we're going to talk a little bit about the process of creating foils and going to put you a little bit in the mindset of the examiner. All right, these are some general things. Note keywords, but, except, most likely. You know, they've gotten rid of all the accept questions on the board exam. 
they don't want you to be dealing with double negatives um, and things like that, so they've taken them out. Almost all questions are written now to be, have an affirmative, positive response, rather than saying, what isn't it? Note red flags in the stem. Sometimes people gloss right over, they read the stem and they don't, you know, they see something and they think, oh, it's just they, you know, they were writing a lot of questions, they got lazy. So the blood pressure in the question as they were reading it was 120 over 100, not 120 over, we all know it's 120 over 80. If they put 120 over 100 there, that's important. That's a narrowed pulse pressure. That's not, a, it's not in there by accident. So you gotta note those things and then process what they mean. Anything that's wrong, and this is where you can get much better, how do you do 10% better without knowing any more? How do you do that? You become a better guesser. So, for example, if I know nothing about the question, it's like you wrote it out in Mandarin, and I don't speak Mandarin or read it or write it, you wrote it out in Mandarin with the choices, so I know nothing, it's all, you know, it's all foreign language to me, what's my chance of getting it right? One in five, 20% because it's five choices, I got a one in five chance. If I can consistently eliminate a few wrong answers from each question that I don't know the definitive correct answer from, and I change myself from consistently guessing from one out of five to one out of three, or if I can make it even better, one out of two, on a 225 question exam, that's 10%. Just by improving your guessing, by appropriately eliminating wrong answers by analyzing. Even if you don't know what the correct answer is, making sure you eliminate wrong answers is very, very valuable. And people don't realize how important eliminating wrong answers is, and it's work, right? If you're gonna do 225 questions and every one that you don't know the answer to, you're gonna work hard on eliminating anything that you can, that's work, you'll, you'll be sweaty, you'll be tired. Um, it takes focus, it takes practice, and that's another thing about this exam, which is you need to make sure that you're rested well enough that you've been doing tests of similar length, which is why these products that I'm talking about, the peer exam, the 1200 questions, the board review on the computer, so you can get ramped up. Because what happens when I look out at a group like you, which is just, it's just normal. Yeah, you're getting ready for an exam, so you do questions 40, 50 at a time. All right, that's fine, that's a good start. But that's not the exam you're gonna be writing. You're gonna be doing questions 200 at a time. And it takes practice, it's an endure, it's a, it's a marathon. I know that my level of focus at the end of the exam and my test taking analysis is already fatiguing. Because I just, I, you know, I just can't keep doing it for that long. So, if part of the answer is wrong, it's wrong. Noting things that are wrong and eliminating from your possible choices is really a super important port. Part, a super important part of test taking. It's okay to guess, right? There's no penalization for wrong answers. So when you don't know, make sure you guess. And we're gonna talk about guessing well in a moment, because that's really important too. No tricks. If it's unfamiliar or wordy, it's usually wrong. All, none, always are usually wrong. The gold standard, you know, people, we, in fact, somebody came to me yesterday and said, oh, when you were talking about beta blockers, what about those lipophilic solutions? Yes, there's a bunch of new articles on treating beta blocker and calcium channel blockers with these lipophilic solutions to bind them up. And <clears throat> they look really good, but it's pretty new stuff. So I didn't mention it when I was talking about it because I'm not sure the exam would go there yet. So brand new stuff, even if it looks great, might not be the answer. You're looking for the standard answer. Old and wrong stuff is wrong. Negative physician behavior is wrong, is wrong. So most of the time, unless it's a question about a subconjunctival hemorrhage, reassure and discharge is probably not the answer. Right, they want you to sort of recognize that things need to be done. We're an active specialty, we do things. So reassure and discharge is usually not the right plan. So what are the mistakes? Not reading the question carefully and, and it's weird because obviously you've read the question. What, what do I mean by that? Did you skip words? You didn't skip words, you read the stem. It's really about syntax logic. Did you actually think about what the stem was asking? And so it's about that logic. And that logic is interesting. And that's why anyone for whom English is not a first language already has a strike against them. 
because every language to a certain degree has its own syntactical logic to it. And the better you are at English syntax logic, the better an exam taker you'll be. And when you look at the difference between, you know, during my years in the residency, multiple times we had the highest scoring resident on the in-service exam in the country. And when I would look at those people, yeah, they were smart. Those residents were smart kids. They were gunners, to be sure. But the difference between them, you know, getting 96 on that exam and someone getting 85, the, 80, the person who got 85 on it was smart too, really smart often, maybe smarter than them. The difference was the 96% the score had this ruthless, syntactical, analytical ability that made them a really good test taker. Pictorial questions. Um, read the question before you focus too much in on the picture.